Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. It still makes me smile to say that here in this space we share on Sundays in this sanctuary and to those of you joining us online in our Zoom sanctuary, welcome. Welcome if you are coming in from the sunshine. Welcome if you are coming in from the cold. Welcome whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey of life. Welcome into this one community in multiple spaces and places. All people of goodwill are welcome here among us. I'm the Reverend Julia Hamilton, and I'm joined this morning by our worship associate, Ellen Broidy, by Matthew Grissett, our music director, and our singers from the music ministry, and Heather Levin on the piano, and Stephanie, our Zoom host, for those of you who are joining us online, and of course, joined by all of you, all of you who have taken the time to be here and nourish your spirit this morning. It is good to be together in all the ways that we gather. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors we have joining us this morning. We would love to get to know you and help you get to know us. Uh, if you are joining us online, you can sign our online guest book. If you're here in person, you can stop by the welcome table after the service, ask any questions you'd like. And we are going to be having a starting point class for new members in January. So if you are new to the congregation and want to get to know other new folks, um, keep an eye out. There'll be more information and a chance to sign up for that class in January. And we will also be celebrating in January the new members that have joined our congregation over this time when we've been navigating uh, our pandemic distance. We have lots going on here at the Unitarian Society beyond Sunday mornings, and I want to highlight a couple of things. Today, we have our holiday craft fair setting up in the garden outside. Our kids and families are going to be participating during the service, but after the service, all are welcome to join in. So make something special for someone special. Try your hand at a little craftiness, get a little holiday spirit. And if you're here in Santa Barbara and joining us online and want to zip on over and join us afterward in the courtyard outside for some craftiness, you're most welcome to do so. We are also going to be having a special solstice evening gathering to join on Goleta Beach with chairs and blankets and maybe something warm, hot chocolate or cider in a thermos to watch the sun set on the shortest day of the year. So if you want to honor the solstice and gather with other folks from our community, uh, go, we're going to go ahead and meet up at Goleta Beach. There's more information in the newsletter and our director of Lifespan Religious Education, Charla Brigante, is coordinating this. So feel free to reach out to Charla with any questions but we're going to take advantage of those beautiful winter sunsets that we get here in Santa Barbara to honor the turning of the season. With all that is going on in our community, all that is going on in your lives, and all that is going on in the world, let us take a moment, take a moment to arrive, to set aside whatever busyness, whatever holiday to-do lists and plans that are waiting for you out in the world, and allow yourself to be here to be present in this space, in this community, as we begin our time of worship together and let the sound of our bell connect us. Light the chalice in the sanctuary. If you have a chalice or candle to light, please do so and enter into the chat or the comments, chalice is lit on and the name of your street or town. While we cannot see all the flames, we know far-flung community. The words for this morning's chalice lighting are by American poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. Penned in 1920, Millay was the first poet I ever seriously read. These few lines comprise the entirety of one of Millay's best known and most enigmatic poems called First Fig. My candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But on my foes and on my friends, it gives a lovely light.
Every week here at the Unitarian Society, we make contributions to what we call our love and justice jar, sort of this imaginary container that holds acts of love and kindness, acts that move our world to the towards the beloved community to which we aspire, places where we see more justice come into being among us. So if you've seen someone this week do something that you thought brought more love and justice into the world, bring it to mind now. Add, add it into the chat if you're joining us online. Line. Think about some place where you have seen someone, either large ways or small ways, bring more love and justice into being. And for our collective contribution to our love and justice jar this morning, I would like to lift up the folks at Jackson's Women's Health Organization. This is, of course, the clinic in Mississippi, the last and only place that is providing abortion services in Mississippi that is the plaintiff in the case that heard oral arguments before the Supreme Court this week. I was glad to see some of you turn up at the rally on Wednesday where we lifted up the need to continue to fight for reproductive justice and access to abortions for all who need them. This is an ongoing uh, fight we're engaged in, folks, and Unitarian Universalism has been part of this struggle for decades. And so I lift up in specific those folks who are working at great personal risk often to continue to provide services to those who need it, in particular the folks at Jackson's Women's Health. Today is also the eighth day and night of Hanukkah, and we are going to be honoring that, that uh, holiday in the service and in music, and so let us let music wash over us. Feel free to sing along if you are at home. Matthew?
This is also the first Sunday in December, and that means we get to do one of my favorite things, which is honor the folks who are celebrating their December birthdays here in our community. So if you have a December birthday and would like to come on up so we can celebrate you and send some love your way, feel free if there's anyone here who is celebrating their birthday in December, come on up, Justine. Got a couple, of, and if you are celebrating a birthday and you're joining us online and you want to type your name or if there's somebody else who is celebrating a birthday in your family and you want to recognize them, go ahead and type their name into the chat. And I also want to recognize that we are going to be celebrating Sarah Davis on December 5th and Becky Blake on December 16th and today. December 5th today. So if you see Sarah Davis, tell her happy birthday. <laughs> I'm Justine and on Tuesday the 7th I will be 55. I'm Emily, on, on December 31st, I will be 39, and my son Emil, on December 31st, will be two. Oh. Oh. And I, ha I have to mention that I'm delighted that next Sunday we will have the very special honor of dedicating Emil uh, as a child to come into our congregation, so that should be a wonderful, joyful occasion. So please join me now in the spirit of love and blessing for all those who are celebrating their birthdays this month. May this coming year unfold for you with joy and health and love. May you have friends to laugh with you during the good times and cry with you during the hard times. May your spirit open to wonder. May your mind be inspired by the world we live in and share. The world is a richer place because you are in it, and we are so glad that you were born. Happy birthday. You may be seated. Yeah, yeah, that's worth applauding for. I would like to invite you now into a time of prayer and reflection and meditation, a time to center and drop down, a time to get in touch with your breath, with your body as it exists in space, sharing this space with other bodies. Perhaps feel your back against your seat or your chair or your sofa. Get in touch with how you're feeling in this moment, <laughs> laughing or crying or finding a deep calm in community. Wherever you are, however you are, be present to this, to this life that we share. And as we enter into a time of quiet together, Call to mind all of those who are in need of support and care, who find themselves in harm's way, seeking safety and refuge. May they find a peaceful place to rest. Call to mind all of those who are suffering with illness or a diagnosis or a long-standing struggle with their body and their health. May they find comfort and care and a community to support them. All those who are welcoming joy and new life and new beginnings, bring them to mind too. Call them into your heart, into your space, and congratulate them. Wish them love and happiness. And if you can, extend that circle of compassion out into the whole world. All beings, all people and places, the earth itself. Hold as much as you can in the compassionate space of your heart as we enter into a time of quiet reflection together.
This morning we are going to share a reading adapted for two voices, and it's by Kendall Gibbons. Two things about the light of Hanukkah. First, put away the sewing. Set down the clock that's losing time and needs to be adjusted. The bank statements to be re reconciled. The penmanship and spelling exercises to complete. The dried beans to sort by size. Look at the light. It is not to be spent in diligence, dutifully illuminating tasks, but seen. From the eye to the mind, to the memory, to the heart, to the soul. From beauty, to gratitude, to faith. Praise the light and the source of light. Be inspired. Do not use the light. Do not lose the holiness of this moment in the press of the ought to be done. It is forbidden to work by the light of these candles. Would you burn your lover's last letter for kindling? Watch the glow like jewels against the velvet of night sky. Waste this light in awe. As in the ancient temple, it is said, they burned the oil, profligate for reverence and thanks. Blessed is the shaping of our lives by commandment and memory. Blessed, Blessed is, is the, the light. light. Second, put the lamp in the window. In a doorway, on the balcony. In the front yard, on the village green, in Times Square, release its beauty to the public view. Do not hoard the light. It is not yours to gloat over in private. Wherever, whenever it is safe, announce the miracle. Invite the neighborhood to remember with you. Perhaps next door, they only half recall the story from some dim childhood ritual. Perhaps your four flames, then five, then six, might awake their dedication anew. Or in the city of a thousand names for God, or none at all, those faithful candles might remind the hurried and the fallen, the defeated of heart, that beauty is yet possible, that the intention of higher purpose endures, even to rouse the captive mind to curiosity. What's the story with those lights? is an opening for the work of spirit. Testify. Let the tongues of flame bear witness to the world that miracles abound and joy abides. Blessed is the heritage of freedom. Blessed is the custom that illuminates our common darkness. Blessed, Blessed is, is the, the sharing, sharing of, of the, the light. light. This year, Hanukkah took me by surprise. After almost 76 years on this earth, one might reasonably assume that I was familiar enough with the quirks and eccentricities of the lunar calendar to be prepared for the holiday whenever it might appear. Clearly, I was not. And when I glanced at our solar calendar, my first thought was, how could it be poss possibly be Hanukkah? We're still digesting Thanksgiving dinner. However, the calendar didn't lie. It truly is the season of the Festival of Light. Like many Jews, I have mixed feelings about Hanukkah, and the more I learned about the true story behind the Maccabees, the temple, and the oil, the more conflicted I became. As a young person, however, the holiday, especially when it occurred late in December, served as a useful counterweight to Christmas. Radio and TV commercials were full of Santa and his elves. The Muzak playing in palaces of unabashed capitalism and consumerism, many founded by Jews who graduated from push carts to grand stone edifices that took up entire city blocks had only Christmas songs. Somehow these, quote, reminders of the season served as a useful, if occasionally painful, lesson about how to negotiate my place in the dominant culture. Clearly, the subliminal messages of assimilation took hold, as even today, I can recall a mere handful of Hanukkah songs, but I'm a veritable jukebox of Christmas carols. There are moments, however, where the dominant culture slipped away, and I could feel myself coming home. And by home, I don't mean the place where I might reside, but rather a more abstract sense of place, where certain objects symbolize safety and belonging. Bright lights and burning candles play a significant role in my feeling of home. I've spoken before about the neighborhood in Manhattan where I grew up, two large housing projects situated next to the East River in an area previously known as the Gas House District. 
The buildings in the projects were 12 stories high on Stuyvesant Town side and 14 stories in Peter Cooper Village. And all the windows, no matter where in the apartment, faced the street. One of my sweetest memories, and a memory that repeated year after year, was walking from the bus stop and glancing up at the windows all around me, some with Christmas lights or Christmas trees, but an exceptionally large number aglow with the bright yellow and orange lights of electric and occasionally real candles in window-sized menorahs. As the eight days of Hanukkah passed and additional candles were lit, whole buildings seemed to light up. The warm glow from the menorahs even helped me learn to respect and appreciate the green and red and gold that made up the Christmas decorations adorning other apartment windows. But it was the yellow and orange flames of the menorahs that called me home, made me feel part of something larger than myself. I knew very few of the people who personally who lived behind those windows. After all, I was just another latchkey kid in the neighborhood. But I somehow understood that at least during the Festival of Light, this was my community. These were my landsmen. I was born in January 1946. One war had just ended, and our country was but a few short years away from another conflict. In my grandparents' Brooklyn neighborhood, where I spent my earliest years, there were household configurations that puzzled me. Some families were standard issue nuclear, mom, dad, assorted children. Others, like mine, were multi-generational. But the ones that struck me were those that had been torn asunder by war, the families where the father had gone off to battle and never returned. I learned early on not to ask too many questions of my playmates who came from homes in which the adults consisted of grandparents and only one parent, always a mother. I became aware of these different configurations as I wandered the Brooklyn streets with my grandmother, my first teacher. One of my earliest memories is of walking at dusk with her. Hanukkah was always the best possible time to traverse the neighborhood. In house after house, the lights were ablaze with candles, and as the week wore on, the light became brighter as another candle was lit commemorating each new day of the holiday. The lights in our neighbors' windows represented warmth, community, and belonging. They served as a bulwark against any feeling of alienation I might have harbored during the Christmas season, in much the same fashion they did for the slightly older me I referred to earlier. There was another kind of light that marked the walks of those early years, the single, lonely candle burning in a front window. When I asked my grandmother what those candles meant, she gave two answers. One informed by her religious tradition, other tailed, other others tailored for the ears of a young child. Her first response was that the candle in the window was a way to let the world know that this was a house that welcomed the stranger, that anyone could find comfort and solace within its walls. It was the second answer, however, that really resonated with me, because as a fearful and somewhat cautious child, I was obsessed with the thought of what might happen if I became separated from my grandmother and couldn't find my way back. My grandmother explained to me that the candle in the window was a beacon, reaching out to anyone who was adrift in any way, who had wandered too far afield. It was a way of saying, this is still your home, you're safe, please knock at the door. As I got a bit older and better able to understand the complex and multiple meanings of symbols, my grandmother offered a third and probably more accurate explanation of the solo candle in the window. It was not there to welcome the stranger or draw back the wanderer, but rather to mark a profound loss. There was no stranger to embrace, no wandering soul searching for the light in a special window called home. Just a candle of memory letting all know that in this house, the bright flame was sending a message of love and longing and sorrow out into the dark night. The bright light represented the soul of the departed. I've always been drawn to the fact that Hanukkah is called the Festival of Light, reminding us that even in the darkest moments, even when the flame represents loss, sometimes all it takes is lighting one candle to illuminate hope.
Every Sunday, USSB gives away 25% of our Sunday offering to support special projects or community partners that share our deepest values and strive to make both our local community and the world a better and more equitable place. This month, we're honored to support the Immigrant Legal Defense Center. The ILDC is committed to providing equal access to justice and due process to indigent immigrants so that no one should ever face immigration court alone. The ILDC statement, vision statement reads, we envision a society where all people are treated equally and with dignity, no matter what their circumstances. Please give as you're moved and able to to this important community resource. I think the text to give will appear on your screen. And please join with me in saying the affirmation of gratitude and giving. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share our gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Good morning. The Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, forfeit your sense of awe, let your conceit diminish your ability to revere, and the universe becomes a marketplace for you. Forfeit your sense of awe, and the universe becomes just a marketplace. The majestic, unthinkably large universe, the sum total of all that is and was and all that ever shall be, the creative force of the universe, which is the closest thing to God that I can imagine. 
If we ever give up on the idea that we must from time to time pause and marvel at all of this, if we ever lose that sense of wonder, then we are reduced to nothing but a transactional life. A small and sad life of task after task, nothing but exchanging time for money. Heschel believed that awe and wonder are categorical imperatives for humanity. That is to say, the desire to experience awe is a compulsion within us, an impulse rooted deep in our humanness that we can never shake and that we ignore at our peril. Religion is in part this practice of the compulsion toward awe. In ways large and small, from elaborate ceremonies at grand cathedrals and synagogues to the tiny lights of a menorah sitting on a kitchen table. Religious ritual is one of the most common ways we human beings create containers for that awe and wonder. Moments of time and space set aside from daily life just to be present to the mystery and miracle of it all. Now I have to say that describing Hanukkah in these terms sometimes feels a little bit overly grand. Theologically, Hanukkah is a minor Jewish holiday. It's not one of the biblically designated holidays like Passover or Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. It was added to the calendar by ancient rabbis written into the Talmud. It is the celebration of the revolt of the Maccabees, who fought against the Syrian emperor Antiochus, and after several years of guerrilla fighting from the hills, finally managed to reclaim their temple in Jerusalem, around 160 BCE. The eight days of Hanukkah are in honor of the miracle of the oil, as part of the rededication of the temple so that it could be used for worship again, the eternal flame was relit. And despite only having a small amount of oil in the reservoir, it lasted for eight days and nights, just long enough to be resupplied. Hanukkah grew in recognition in part, as Ellen mentioned, because of its proximity to Christmas as a way of claiming space for Jewish identity in an overwhelmingly Christian culture. The story appeals to the desire to root for the underdog and overcome against great odds. But in practice, Hanukkah is a family affair, centered in the home like so many Jewish rituals. And especially when compared to major holidays on the Jewish calendar like Passover, it, it kind of moves through the daily family life. In my multi-faith household, for example, we celebrate Hanukkah by taking time each evening, usually right before dinner, to light the menorah and say the traditional prayer, and our daughter gets her gift, one for each night. And that's usually about it. One or two nights out of the week, we might do a little more, make latkes or gamble with dreidels and chocolate coins. But even though it may take only a few minutes out of the day, each night there is something magical about watching the candles come to life, observing the light grow brighter each successive evening, pausing in the early darkness of the season, to say a prayer of thanks to the creative force of the universe. After all, we are celebrating the story of a miracle, however minor that miracle may have been. It's still enough to spark the resonance of the miraculous within us, even if it only lasts for half an hour. Because without those few minutes of candlelit beauty, without pausing, to remember that life is more than just getting dinner on the table or getting homework done or getting that last email sent. Without moments like that, life is just a marketplace. While the Hanukkah candles are burning, you are not supposed to do work. The emails and text messages can wait. The cleaning up of the house can wait. The TV can stay silent. And you don't blow out the candles. You just let them burn down. On most nights, especially as the days grow shorter, 
We are surrounded by all kinds of other lights in our life. We're surrounded by the glow of the computer screen as we finish up that last bit of work. We're surrounded by the fluorescent hum of the lights in retail shops or at the grocery store. The pale gaze of our smartphones flickering to life in a darkened room. These are the lights of the marketplace. They surround us all the time, and it's harder and harder to escape their presence. But for a few minutes, for a few nights, usually in December, the candles spring to life and reclaim space and time for something else, something different, something that produces nothing tangible and adds nothing to the gross national product something sacred. As Kendall Gibbon said in the reading that we shared, the light is not to be spent in diligence, dutifully illuminating tasks, but to be seen. In this moment, we are there to bear witness to the light and celebrate the creative source to which it is connected. The universe, the warmth of a million suns, the fire at the heart of all things. The universe shines in that half hour of glowing menorah flames, no matter how tiny the candles. It's a big task for a little candle, but fire is elemental and it makes that leap from the mundane to the sublime with ease. The ancient Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos is the linear sense of time that is the basis of our clocks, our appointments, the work day and the alarm clock that wakes you up in the morning. It keeps us organized, it keeps the trains on schedule and the planes in the air. Chronos is the time that drives the marketplace, the ringing of our phones, the ringing of the bell of the stock exchange the crush of shoppers waiting for those doors to open on a Black Friday, even the countdown on New Year's Eve, that's chronos, that's an orderly sense of the progression of time. But then there is also kairos. Kairos means the right time or the opportune moment. Kairos is not about a linear progression of events, not about the predictable movement of the sundial or the second hand. Kairos is more of a feeling, a feeling about the rightness of the moment, the alignment of plans, the awareness of something that is more than just the next thing on your shopping list feeling like part of something important, feeling like part of a community. Kairos is what we are talking about when someone says the time has come or it's about time. Rabbi Jeffrey Middleman explains it this way. He says, the Greeks had two different words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos was the quantitative sense of time. It could be measured and dissected and most importantly was undifferentiated. Kairos, in in contrast, was the qualitative sense of time. It was psychological, how we felt time. And it reminded us that not every moment was exactly the same. Some moments were more powerful, more important, more holy than others. To phrase it another way, he said, if Kronos is the date of your wedding, Kairos is your wedding day. So time is paradoxical, he says. Sometimes we look at it through our daily or weekly schedules, placing all our obligations and opportunities on our calendar. And sometimes when we look at it this way, it is something that we use and has value only to the extent that it can help us achieve our goals. But sometimes, he says, we look at time through the lens of what is most special and most important in our lives. When we look at it in this way, it is something we experience and has value in and of itself. Kairos has value in and of itself, not because of what it creates. Lighting the candles on the menorah is an invitation to experience Kairos, to set aside the hourly 
and step into a more transcendent experience of time. Some might call this wasted time, sitting and staring at candles, gazing at the night sky, wandering the neighborhood to see the lights. Waste the light in awe, Kendall Gibbons says. But she takes it one step further. Don't just waste the beauty on yourself. Put a lamp in the window. Spread the light that invites questions, evokes memories, communicates something, something of the sacred on a regular old Tuesday. Remind your neighbors that there is more to life than just what we get paid for. Testify to joy. Testify to beauty. Testify to wonder and awe. The menorah lights in the window are a call to Kairos for the whole community. Stop, look, wonder, drop down, out of Kronos and into a flow of time that is more expansive. Don't worry about where you are rushing to or rushing from. Say hello, lean over the fence and chat a bit. Ask open-ended, open-hearted questions that might take two or three conversations to answer. Don't hoard the light, but share it. You don't have to be Jewish or married to someone who is Jewish in my case to honor the spirit of this holiday, this little bright festival. You don't have to have a menorah to take a moment to pause in the evening and light a candle and give thanks and see how it changes the whole room to remember that miracles are just a matter of perspective. Hanukkah is an opportune moment, a kairos moment, an invitation to attend to the kind of joy that can only be shared and given away, never bought or sold. Earlier this week, I made latkes, potato pancakes that are one of the traditional foods for Hanukkah. It was a Thursday night, and we had a friend over for dinner. And somehow, the latkes were like the oil in the lamp that they remind us of as we fry them in the pan. That is to say, I was cooking them for a long time. I kept scooping up balls of shredded potato and pressing them into the pan, and yet when I looked at the bowl, it seemed like there was still more always waiting. I was frying potatoes for what seemed like enough for at least two or three dinners, or maybe eight, I didn't know. Slowly, the tray filled up with crispy pancakes until I pulled the last one from the pan and set it in the very last spot on the largest baking sheet I own, more latkes than I knew what to do with. But of course, once you start sharing, there's always more, somehow. And they all get eaten in the end. Light begets light. Flame kindles flame. And I had nothing to show for it but a few grease spots on my apron and a full and happy heart. Happy Hanukkah. Share the light. May it be so. Blessed be and amen.
If you'd like to rise in body or spirit, put your hands over your heart perhaps, or hold your hands open, whether you're here in this sanctuary or in our Zoom sanctuary, however it is that you get connected to that sense of larger life that runs through us and among us and beyond us, and as you go out into this beautiful and heartbreaking world, may you find or make space for moments of kairos, Moments where you can drop down, shift time and space, and get in touch with that which is most holy to you and to your community. And may the light of love shine upon you, out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it call out a blessing. If you would like to hum along quietly here in this space, go ahead. If you'd like to sing out loud at home, sing for all of us. Let us call out a blessing. <laughs> 